there's people out there who say that memory might not even, might not even be stored in the brain have you ever heard this oh goodness this is this is this is what i was hoping to talk about <laughs> on your show man um i want to hear where you where you've heard this from but i i'll tell you my experience so okay you know i learned about this stuff in 2009 and just started improving my memory and and you know i had an experience yeah with my first example i, I listened to a, a, a an audiobook and it walked me through an example just like you did in, in joshua Fower's book i was like wow this is cool it works um but over the years as i've tried to be faster and you know i've, I've trained the skill down to something that's so automatic for certain things not every memory task but like the cards for example like i would drill that every single day mm -hmm. and sometimes you know i'm trying to get down to under 30 seconds to look at a deck of cards mm -hmm. in my prime uh, i'm not there anymore but um and i'll rem i will never forget this i my the one time i've kept flirting with 30 below 30 seconds i could get 30 seconds point eight four, 31 seconds 30.12 but never break the 30 second barrier and one time i did this was christmas 2012 and i got 29.74 i believe as my second my, my time and i was like oh man I, I broke it i did it and it was such a weird experience because i remember memorizing the deck going like the experience of actually going through the deck memorizing i was like there was a part of my brain that was like I, i'm not actively doing anything right now like i don't feel like i'm memorizing anything i'm just it was like a flow state right yeah, yeah. for memory and then when it was done i just knew it all and that was like the first time that i ever felt that i wasn't a part of the memory process that it was like coming from somewhere else Whoa. you know and that was weird. It doesn't happen all the time, but in these uh, flow states, yeah. especially with memory, like with flow state, you know, they're shooting basketballs, everything goes in. Like it's, you're just kind of like mindless in, in the state, right. Of, of doing this, but with it's memory, almost like out of body experience. Yeah. But with, yeah. And we, but with memory, like it is all about your mind, but being away from your mind as your mind is doing something is a really trippy experience. And so I've, in the last five years, uh, we talked about this briefly, but I've, been more in touch with my spiritual side and, and remote viewing and kind of having these psi experiences and psychedelics and stuff. I, I'm pretty convinced that I don't think all memory is coming from inside of here, that I think it's just a receiver, that there's some substrate out there that has all information about everything, including my personal memories and things that I've memorized and will memorize. And I'm just, we are all able to tap in and out of that. Um, to get information, mm. to, to write information, you know? That's my feeling. Yes. Um, and with the remote viewing, that's why I wanted to talk to you about it because it's, I, when I visualize things in my memory space, it's so similar to how I get a download when I'm remote viewing. Like the visual space is almost the same. So I almost feel like remote viewing is like kind of memory, but for things that are non-local or for the future, you know? You've actually done remote viewing? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Really? Yeah. We we step into that in a moment, but I, I was I was curious to hear why you brought that other question up. Well, obviously in the in the book in the Joshua Fower book, they explain that they they they've been doing experiments on rats and I think monkeys where they try to take out pieces of the brain okay. to figure out where memory is stored. Right, we've been trying to figure out which part of the brain stores memory, and. There, all, there's all these experiments where we take out different parts of the brain, but memory never seems to go away, at least long-term memory. There's yeah. some parts of the brain, I think the hippocampus you can take out where short-term memory seems to reset every day. Yeah. But for the most part, it seems like from all the experiments that have been done, memory is sporadic throughout the brain. Like it's like a hologram projected on the entire brain. So as long as, as long as like, there's enough brain there so you can be a functioning an, like function and be alive and not paralyzed yeah. that you can still remember stuff or yeah, at least yeah. animals can still remember stuff based on the experiments. Right. And um, I think I was listening to Rupert Sheldrake talk about this where um, it's basically similar to what you said, where he believes that the human brain is not like a hard drive on a computer. It's more like a television set where if you're watching the television, the show you're watching isn't stored on the screen, on the television itself. It's being streamed from somewhere. Yeah. Pulled in from the antennas or right. Wi-Fi or whatever. Yeah. Right. Which is a compelling idea for sure. But then like the question is, how do you explain 
how do you explain somebody who has played piano their whole entire life and and can play Beethoven or play every Beethoven song or Bach or whatever it is like flawlessly effortlessly because they've spent hours and days and years doing this stuff right they've spent the time doing that and yeah. I can't do that right so how do you explain that if it is just a stream yeah of of that you're getting this stream into your brain from some higher level of memory or consciousness or whatever it is how come only that person who spent all that time practicing it can do it right no like why can't you say oh i'm gonna tap into that right and suddenly play beethoven or mozart right i, I don't know uh maybe it's not so much about maybe it's more that that trained person has found the right channel through the practice maybe that's what practice is mm. is, is like honing that connection right to the information that's out there and you don't quite know like how to get that channel but maybe through the practice you get there i don't know <laughs> right I, I don't know how to explain or answer that question i don't have the answer um just speculation but um there's there's definitely something that we don't know or can't explain about how the memory performs and, and the brain performs yeah so, you know i yeah it's a mystery the morphic resonance thing is interesting too that sheldrake talks about like and I, th I also believe this might be in the in the book in the four book but like i think it was whenever the first person broke the record for the the four minute mile or did like yeah. the four minute mile yeah it was the first time in history anyone had ever done that and then like it wasn't more than a couple months later that people started breaking it all over the world. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's like the same, barrier. like when a problem is solved in one part of the world, somebody very soon after solves that problem in a different, completely different part of the world, completely disconnected from that person. Yeah. And um, he calls that theory morphic resonance that like there's this resonance that's connected. Consciousness is somehow connected to these people that they figure something out. And this is also connected to like the simulation theory. So like if we are in a video game, something gets rendered in one part of the video game, it's automatically easier to render here. So it's conserving <laughs> processing power. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, we, we find that same uh, uh, phenomenon in, in memory sports too, where with the cards, you know, I couldn't break 30 seconds. Like 30 seconds was a barrier for, mm -hmm. it was like the one minute mile for a long time. And then oh, really? some of the Germans uh, broke that pretty uh, uh, convincingly. And then just like the dominoes fell, like everybody was breaking 30 seconds. And now, well, I don't know now, maybe like five, six years ago, it was 20 seconds and yeah. have since broken that. Mm -hmm. And now it's like the 15 to 10 second mark is like the new one minute mile, yeah. uh, four minute mile, sorry. Yeah, it's bizarre, dude. It, yeah. it, re it really is when you start trying to reconcile things like the simulation and this morphic res resonance stuff and the brain being an antenna to the idea of of memory and like how is it stored because we know i mean just based on those experiments like they i mean i don't think steve maybe you can find this but i don't think there's been any sort of like conclusive science that points to exactly where short-term or long-term memory is stored in the brain do you know of anything i don't know I, I yes and no i mean i think there's certain things that you can pinpoint are being generated here or accessed here but then I think there's other things where it's like not so clear why or where this is being stored per se. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at scans of memory athletes using memory techniques yeah. uh, in a, like an fMRI machine and yeah. their whole brain is lighting up. You know, it's not just those components that we attribute to memory, mm. um, which is interesting, you know? Yeah, it's really crazy too how there's uh, people that have like severe autism or have, there was one guy in the book that had like this crazy seizure when he was like four years old and it, it somehow broke his brain into being like a genius where he could like recall crazy stuff. He could do incredible math experiments in his mind. He was taking equations. He was like somehow like visualizing pi in his mind and he could see it all. And like he could recite like the first whatever, 6,000 uh, digits of pi in his mind because of was some, this in the book yeah okay towards the end yeah this was guy, it um there was a documentary made about this guy yes i know a lot of daniel about, something yeah daniel tamet yeah that's it it took me a minute to find a, a good visual representation but this, this i think does good justice right but like what like when was the study done and like did they find out exactly where memory is stored like 
I'd be curious if there's like a conclusive uh, summary on this stuff that like scientists agree on. Interesting story. Well, they talk about it in the book with Daniel Tammet, mm -hmm. um, how he was actually a memory athlete. Did you get oh, to that yeah, part? Yeah, yeah. There was a little bit of scandal there that, um, not to say that he wasn't on the spectrum and had some abilities with his memory, but he was in part, or maybe more than we think, using memory techniques for oh, some oh, of really? that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the AI says, no, there is no single definitive conclusion on where memory is stored in the brain. Scientific understanding has moved away from the idea of memory being located in, the spe in one specific spot. Instead, memory is a dynamic process involving multiple brain regions and the physical alter alterations of countless connections between neurons. Wow. Yeah. Memory is not the fixed. <laughs> Wasn't there, I mean, it makes yeah. sense, man. Yeah. So so then wouldn't that make this this picture bullshit? Yes, that would make that picture <laughs> bullshit, <fuckers>. Steve. <laughs> I mean, I think it's saying that some of these parts of the brain are involved, high, highly involved in these processes, but that's not the, the, the end of the picture, you know? Well, there was one guy who was like the most studied man in brain science or something who okay. had, he had a seizure. It was a different guy who had a seizure when he was young and he had a... Um, what is it called when they take out a part of your brain because you have seizures? Uh, yeah, well, they, yeah, I don't know the name. It was the they procedure where, yeah. where they take out part of your brain uh, because you're having seizures, and that basically broke his short-term memory. And but he couldn't he, remember longer than like a few seconds, right? Short-term memory. Yes, short-term memory. But he had like all of his memory before that point. He yeah. could remember everything. He would wake, wake, wake up every day. It was like groundhog. Every day was the same day over and over again. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Well, you have people who are well advanced with Alzheimer's and, you know, there's certain things that will activate their their memory, like music, for example. Oh, really? Yeah, and they suddenly can be lucid in their memories for a few minutes while they experience this nostalgic music, you know? Mm, temporal lobotomy. Oh, uh, lobotomy, yeah. Lobec lobectomy? Lobectomy? Lobectomy. In 53, he received a bilateral medial temporal lobotomy to surgically reset a part of his brain. That's crazy. Uh, oh, because he had epilepsy. epilepsy That's yeah. why they did it. Good God, dude. Could you, could you imagine getting brain surgery in the fucking 50s? Yeah. Like well, it how says he primitive that house was that? <laughs> yeah. He wasn't able to store or form new memories. Um, yeah. 